Hi, and uh, welcome to this video on bagging and random forest, which are two different algorithm or techniques uh, for machine learning. And uh, this video is really supposed to be a continuation of the previous video where we introduced bias and variance. So you should really have watched that first. Okay, so let's get to bagging first. Uh, the first of these two terms is, I guess, the simplest one to explain. So bagging which is also called bootstrap aggregation. And it's in general a technique for reducing, uh, in some sense, the variance of the return hypothesis. Where variance here is, is in the in terms of the definition of bias and variance decomposition that we just saw in the, in the previous video. So it's a general technique that you could always use. Uh, if I have a learning algorithm, so you can always just apply bagging on top of it. So it's a, kind of like a meta algorithm that you can build on top of another learning algorithm. Okay. And the basic idea here is that or with bagging is that it gives the best improvements if the algorithm that you're using that you're using it on is in some sense unstable, means that the, the things that it outputs, they can vary a lot, right, based on the training data and so on. So it's kind of like a, a high variance algorithm that you already have. And this bagging technique is a way of reducing that variance. Okay, so let's try to make that a bit more formal and see what we what we actually mean. And maybe just to mention here that a particular type of learning algorithm that actually is or tends to be um, more unstable or have high variance is uh, decision and regression trees. So this bagging technique really goes very well together with uh, these uh, trees, but it could also be used with other learning algorithms. Okay, so just before we introduce bagging, maybe let's just try to give some intuition for its definition. Okay, so the basic idea is that we would like to reduce the variance in the returned estimate, like the in the in the hypothesis produced. It should not vary too much compared to say the average hypothesis that we talked about in the previous video. So in general, when we want to reduce variance, uh, then you know typically we, we just for random variables, if we have a random variable x that has some variance sigma squared, then if I have a bunch of independent copies of the same random variables, they're identically distributed, they're independent, then if I return the average of these m random variables, then the variance reduces by a factor of m. And the expectation is, of course, the same of this random variable because I have m copies of the same random variable scaled by 1 over m. So the expectation is the same, but the variance goes down by a factor of m. Okay, so, so what are we saying here? So in general, we're saying if I have a random variable with high variance, then if I have a bunch of copies of the same random variable that are independent and I average these random variables, then I reduce the variance a lot. So averaging independent identities to a random variable reduces variance. And now we'll try to, I guess, use this as a guiding idea, so to say, in designing a new learning algorithm uh, called bootstrap aggregation or bagging. So averaging independent random variables and identically distributed random variables reduces the variance. And uh, what we had before was that we saw in the previous video, we saw this bias variance decomposition uh, expression, the expected out of sample error of the hypothesis learned on a data set D. So D here is a data set uh, drawn from some unknown distribution. And we're interested in understanding the expected out of sample error. Right? We saw in the previous video that this could be written as a sum of a bias term and a variance term. And the variance term is really uh, the expectation over a new uh, data point x from this unknown distribution of the expected squared difference between the prediction made by the average hypothesis. Again, you should really have watched the previous video. The average hypothesis uh, produced by this learning algorithm, if I draw a, a data set D, and so this is the, the average hypothesis versus the hypothesis that you actually get on a new data set D. So this is kind of the variance in the prediction of this uh, uh, this model that you train on a data set D when you evaluate it at X. Okay, so the bias variance decomposition says that, okay, if we can reduce the variance, then we're gonna make improvements in the expected out of sample error, at least if we can keep the bias roughly, roughly fixed. And the basic idea now is that um, we'll basically use this intuition that if I had many random variables that follow the same distribution, and then averaging them would reduce the variance. So what we could say here, right here, the random variable is in some sense the, uh, the hypothesis that I get on a new data set D. So if I could somehow, you know, actually have M different data sets that all come from this uh, same distribution, all have the same size, and I train a hypothesis on each and every one of them, 
then if I use the hypothesis that just returns the average output of these M hypotheses, then that would have less variance, right? So intuitive that hypothesis, this averaging over M training exam in training data sets, that should have less variance and as such would have a, maybe a better out assembly error, at least if the bias is, is smaller. That's the basic idea in bagging. So let's see how we can instantiate it. Right, so we wanna do this. We wanna somehow train M different models on uh, M different hypotheses on M different data sets and then use the average. Now, the issue is that we don't have M training data sets when we're, when we're uh, training our machine learning model. We only have one data set. Now, of course, we could partition it into M chunks, train a model on each of them, and then do the average of these M models. Uh, the issue is that then we have less training data available for each of these simple hypotheses, right, H1 to, to HM. Uh, we don't use the full data set, uh, which means that actually the bias will, will typically get worse if we have less training data. So this is not uh, the right idea. So what we do in bagging instead is that we say, okay, I wanna in some sense simulate having M data sets. The way I'm gonna do it is I'm gonna repeat M times, and then I'm gonna sample a subset of my input data set. So for some parameter N prime, typically chosen to be less than the original data set, or maybe at most the same size. I repeatedly sample N, I sample N prime of the data points from my original data set, and the sampling here is with replacement, which means that if I sample the same element, I can sample it again. Right? So I just sample it uniformly uh, in prime time. So I just pick a random uh, data example and put it in a new data set, DI. Okay, so when I construct a DI, then I train a hypothesis on DI. Okay, so I do this M times. So this is kind of similar to saying, okay, I'm not going to construct DI disjoint data sets but I'm gonna subsample my data. So I'm gonna construct DI, I'm gonna construct M data sets that kind of overlap a little bit, but they don't contain all the training data and none of them contain, contain all the data. And then if it's a regression problem where I have to output a value at the end of the day, uh, the very natural thing to do is just as we uh, motivated before, uh, I'll just output the average of the predictions made by these M different uh, hypotheses. I right, kind of like this, this idea that averaging should reduce variance. Okay. Similarly, if it's in a classification problem, then each of these hypotheses output either minus one or plus one. If I return the sign of the sum, it's basically taking a majority vote. I'm just asking, you know, are there more that think that this should be predicted plus one or are there more that believe this should predict minus one? Yeah, so this is what I do for, for classification. Uh, so I'll soon try to visualize this algorithm. Uh, it's very simple actually. And, um, the basic idea is that, or well, there are also some other observations other than this intuition of reducing variance is that, well, uh, if I have some points with noise on them, right, then there's gonna be a bunch of these data sets that excludes that point. So a bunch of these hypotheses that are involved, they will not be trained on this noise or this uh, uh, outlier point, if you will. So, so in some sense, it should reduce the risk of, of overfitting noise on a training point. And it also by this intuition of averaging, it should kind of reduce the variance. And that's at least the intuition. Of course, these data sets are not uh, independent, right? They are highly overlapping since you're sampling subsets of the original data set. But that's at least the hope is that the variance should still be small. So maybe just me try to visualize here. So let's say you have this training data up here. And uh, you'd like to train a classifier, maybe a linear classifier is, is the base learning algorithm that you're applying bagging on top of, right? So uh, for a linear model, you would maybe run the perceptron learning algorithm, find a hyperplane and use everything on one side as, as the red class and everything on the other side as the blue class, blue being plus one and red being minus one. Now with bagging, what you do instead is you would sample these uh, subsets of the data. So basically you're gonna first sample one data set by randomly including uh, examples from the original data set. So maybe you sample this one, maybe you sample this one, maybe you send this data point, and maybe you sample this one again. So uh, we do in bagging, we sample with replacement, which means that I can sample the same point multiple times. Okay, so I could have a copy of this point, which basically just means that it'll count twice in a zero one loss if, if I make a mistake on it. So I just keep going until I've sampled a sufficiently large uh, training data set, maybe half the size of the original data set or something like this. Okay. But I don't just do this once, right? I repeat it M times. So I sample different subsets of this original input data set, giving me 
uh, m different uh, training data sets. M is a parameter that you choose when you use the bagging, so like a hyperparameter. Okay, so you subsample all these data sets, and uh, what the algorithm bagging says is that we should train a hypothesis on each and every one of them. So maybe if you uh, run the perceptron learning algorithm on the first data set, maybe it will terminate with uh, with this hypothesis here. Maybe if you run it on the second data set, you'll get this one. And if you run it on the third data set, maybe you'll get this one here. And so you train one on each of these uh, data sets. Okay. Now the output, this is a classification problem, right? Would be the sign of uh, these three, the prediction made by these three, right? So the majority of these three. So let's see what does that actually look like? So here I just overlaid these three hypotheses that were trained on top of each other up here. And then we can ask ourselves, well, if I get a new point, uh, depending on where it lands, what would the prediction be? And so maybe you can start by asking, okay, what if it lands down here in this lower right corner? Well, then all the three hypotheses that we trained say blue, so the majority is blue, right? So everything in here will be classified as blue. You can also go to this neighboring cell here. Here there are two of them that say blue and one of them would say red. So it's still blue, that's the majority. So anything in here will be classified as blue. Okay, if you go to this one here, there's still two of them that would say blue. And there's one of them that would say red. So the majority is still blue. If you go down here, we'll see that, oh, there's, there's only one of them that says blue. And they're, they're very namely the one, the middle one down here. And two of them are saying red, right? The, the leftmost and the rightmost one here. So this region here, the majority is red. So here you would, you would output red. You would output blue. There are two of them that say blue, one that say red. Here you would say red, and up here you'd say red. Okay, so so this actually gives the new decision boundary. And the interesting thing is that it's not always, you know, this decision boundary is not a linear model, right? It's actually uh, actually have a jacked line. Uh, so you can create using banking, you can get more complicated decision boundaries. So of course, one would worry that the VC dimension grows uh, of this these type of uh, hypotheses you can create. So it's a more complicated hypothesis. On the other hand, this bias variance decomposition tells us that maybe this will reduce this variance and actually lead to uh, to a small outer sample error. Okay, so that is bagging. It's a very simple technique, just subsample the data set and train a, a hypothesis in each of them and then combine them either using a majority vote for classification or just averaging them for regression problems. Okay, so what is random forest then? So random forest, I guess, is a specialization of, of bagging in some sense. So the intuition from bagging was again, right? I had this random variable. I wanted, to, uh, or the intuition came from having a random variable that I wanted to reduce the variance of. And then I said, okay, um, the way we one could do it is if I had m var random variables of the same distribution and they're independent, then averaging them reduces the variance, right? It creates a new random variable with the same expectation but a much smaller variance, right? So, so that was the basic idea. So the way we then implemented this strategy or this intuition or used it to de define this bagging algorithm was to train on many subsamples of the data set and then average the results from these subsamples, right? That was the basic idea here. Now, as also said before, right? The hypotheses that you train on these subsamples of the data, they are actually not independent. Uh, they are, they do have the same distribution though. They, uh, they identically distribute because they just used to sample a random subset and train on it. So they each of these hypotheses do have the same distribution, um, but they're not independent because you're subsampling from the same data set. Okay, so, so the issue here is that, well, this averaging is actually not really true, right? You, you, you don't just get this average because this required independent identity distributed random variables for the variance to go down by, by this factor M. Okay. So the idea in, in this random forest algorithm that uh, I'll present next is that if I have these random variables kind of, kind of corresponding maybe to separate rounds of uh, this bagging, they, they are identically distributed with some fixed variants. Uh, but then if you look at what's called the pairwise correlation, so in some sense, how correlated are these random variables? Right? If they are correlated by some row, then the average, the variance here is, uh, well, you have the term where it goes down by the factor M like you had before. Right? So this is what we like. But you also have to pay uh, something like the variance times this pairwise correlation. Okay. So without going formally into uh, the definition of any of this, 
uh, the basic idea to have in mind is just, or the basic intuition that inspires random forests is that, okay, uh, since pairwise correlations ruin the variance, right, it prevents us from reducing the variance when doing these averaging, then we'll try to somehow ensure that these um, hypotheses that we train on different subsample data sets are kind of not that correlated with each other. Right. So, so that's a, a new idea to try and put on top of it. Okay, so maybe if the intuition doesn't make too much sense, uh, you can just look at what does the algorithm do. So let's have a look at, at that. Right. And okay, so one crucial thing here about random forest is that uh, random forest, while bagging wasn't a technique you can use for any kind of learning algorithm, uh, random forest is, is tailored to decision trees and regression trees. That's also why it's called a random forest because you combine a whole bunch of trees, which gives you a forest. Okay, so decision trees uh, or regression trees. So in random forest, right, what we do, we still do these subsamples of the data set, right, like we did in bagging. So for M times, we're gonna sample a data set, typically a little bit smaller than the original one, maybe up to the same size, but there should still be some left out points. So we sample one of these data sets uh, with replacements. So you can sample the same point multiple times, call this data, the ith data set di. And then we're gonna train a decision tree or regression tree on this data set. And so, so far, everything is exactly the same as bagging, uh, just that we've fixed that the learning algorithm has to be a, a decision or regression tree. Okay, so we train one of those trees, but here's the tweak now. So when we're building a tree, if you remember one of the previous videos, we are kind of typically growing these decision trees by uh, repeatedly taking a leaf node and doing a greedy algorithm where we replace it by a small decision stump. So we're computing the best split we can do along any of the features. Right. So if you don't remember this, I uh, maybe should go back and watch the video on decision trees. Right. So, so basically we're growing these trees and each time we want to build a new node in the decision tree, we try all the features we could ask a question on, we try all the values we could ask a question on and we look at which one gives the biggest improvement in the quality of the tree. Right. But now <clears throat> the idea in random forest is that when we are computing one of these splits, we're going to choose some of the data features, right? Normally you're allowed to split on all D features, but now I'm going to randomly pick P of them for some parameter P. And then I tell you, okay, you're only allowed to use one of those P features to compute your split. You're not allowed to split on all the D features. And then, and this is the whole algorithm. And then finally, uh, if you're doing a regression problem, you've trained all these trees and all these different data sets, you're just going to average them. And if it's classification, you're just going to take a majority vote. So the basic idea is just to constrain uh, the tree building algorithm. So in some sense that the trees that you're constructing in all these iterations, you're kind of forcing that it's not the same tree that you'll keep building, right? So by disallowing some of the data features, uh, you'll build different trees. And in that, that sense, uh, hopefully these the correlation between the trees should should decrease. That's the basic idea. And okay, so there are some rules of thumbs that have been suggested in, in the literature. Uh, one rule of thumb is for classification, maybe you choose square root D of the features. If it's a regression, maybe you choose D or three, right? But these are just rules of thumbs. And what you could do instead is to have it as a hyperparameter for your uh, random forest construction algorithm. And, and then you do use a set aside a validation data set and use a grid search to, to uh, just try different choices for these parameters using the validation set to figure out what is the best uh, P that you could use. Okay. Maybe just let me mention one nice property of these two, uh, both random forest and bagging. In, in particular, if you have this last step where you wanna do grid search or we wanna figure out what's the best choice of this, um, of this hyperparameter giving the number of splits. And, and here, right, it, whenever you have a subsample data set, you could try to construct a tree with different choices for, like you have different choice for the hyperparameter. And, and for this, you'll need a validation data set. And, and typically, right, you could also have the, many of your other algorithms, the one that you're, maybe you're, uh, maybe you're running linear regression instead of a decision tree. If it's bagging, you could be running linear regression and maybe your model here has a weight decay parameter or some other hyperparameter and, and you would like to have a validation data set. One important point with these two algorithms is that there's actually in every round when you train one of these um, basic algorithms, learning algorithms, 
uh, you have some data that you don't use, right? All the ones that are not included in the in the sample DI. So you can actually just use those to perform validation if you if you need to. So that's a nice trick. And basically, these are called the out of bag samples, the ones that are not included in the in the bootstrap sample. Right. So that that can save a validation set or can be used for automatic cross validation, if you will. Right. So that's just a minor minor remark. Okay. So I think let us conclude just by trying to to run an experiment where we compare just a simple decision tree uh, versus bagging versus random forest. Okay, and the data we're gonna look at, so what we wanna look, look at is actually wanna make an experiment where we can compare the bias and the variance of these three algorithms. And if we wanna actually know what the bias and the variance is, uh, then we actually do need to know what the data distribution is which means that this bias variance decomposition is mostly useful for as intuition for coming up with, with bagging and random forest. Uh, it's not something that you can normally compute the bias and the variance on it, not on a just you have one data set, right? You would actually need to know the data distribution to generate many data sets to compute the, the average hypothesis and so on. Okay, so, so here we're just gonna look at an experiment where we know what the data distribution is. We're gonna get data that has uh, 50, each uh, example has 15 features, all uniformly between zero and two, okay. And the target function that we're trying to learn is the label of any given feature vector that has 15 features is just the sum of squares differences from one, right? So just a, some arbitrary target function, some arbitrary data distribution. And let's try to see what these algorithms do if we try to, to implement them here. And we would like to compare the bias and the variance of these three uh, algorithms, okay. So I guess the question is, how can we actually compute the bias and the variance? And I guess there's several ways, um, but here I'm just gonna show a way one can at least cheat and try to approximate the bias and the variance if we know this data distribution and we actually do know the target function. So, so it is really cheating, but let's try. All right, so recall again from the previous video that the bias is uh, this expression here is the expectation or a new training example. So here we know what the data distribution is of the square difference between the, the average model and the unknown target function. And the variance down here, right, is the expectation, basically the expectation of the square difference between the prediction made by the average model and one, and the prediction made by uh, the hypothesis you get on a new data set D. Okay, so well, let's try to estimate how, how could we perhaps estimate the bias, right? So the bias was just this expression here. And recall again that the average hypothesis is the expectation over a data set of the, if, uh, the hypothesis that I get on this data set. Okay, the prediction that that makes on X is what we should compare to the true label of X. So what we can do is that we can kind of try and, and figure out what is this average hypothesis. Uh, so the way that we, can, that we can do this is that we can Let's sample a very large test data set, right? We know this is just for the experiment, right? This is not something you can do in general. Now it's just for an experiment to compare these three algorithms. So what we could do in an experiment is to say, okay, I know the data distribution. So I just compute a huge test set um, that will be very similar to, so the performance of any hypothesis on this giant test set would be very similar to the outer sample error of this, uh, this hypothesis. So then what we're gonna do is also, we wanna figure out what is this average hypothesis, right? So again, I know the data distribution in this experiment, so I can just sample a whole lot of data sets. So I'm gonna do that. And for each of those data sets, I'm gonna train a model, right? I'm gonna actually compute one of those HDs. And then on this large test set, I'm gonna take this HD and evaluate it on the test set. And this gives me a prediction YD. Now, what I will then do is I'll just average all those predictions uh, to get a Y prime. And the observation is that this is the average. So basically this gives me the model that I trained on all these many data sets. I get all their predictions and then I'm gonna average them, which is exactly the prediction that the, uh, the average hypothesis would make. At least if I sample enough data sets, this, these tend to be the same. So this is just my hack to, to actually estimate the bias or the average hypothesis. I'm gonna figure out what the average hypothesis makes of predictions on all these examples. And then I'm just gonna, because I'm gonna, I'm gonna run an experiment where it's a, it's a regression problem with the least squared loss. And that means that then I can just compute the least squared loss as the sum of squared differences between the true predictions and the, uh, or the true labels and the predictions that I make from using this average hypothesis. 
and then I'm just going to average it over the train, the, this very large training data set. Okay, so so just to say briefly, I I'm going to estimate I guess the out assembly error of the average hypothesis. I'm going to estimate the out the average hypothesis by running a whole lot of experiments where I sample a data set and figure out what what hypothesis would I produce here. I'm just going to average all their predictions on a huge test set, which would then using a huge test set would approximate the behavior on on new data. Okay, so I'm, this is just to say how did we uh, in the following experiment estimate the bias. Okay, but it all requires that I know the data distribution and everything. So this is just to run an experiment and compare. How could I then estimate the variance? Well, this is another expression. Um, one hack is to say, well, the, we already know that the expected out assembly error is equal to the bias plus the variance. We've just computed the bias. And we could also just uh, compute or estimate the, the out assembly error. It's the expectation over a new data set of and uh, the out assembly error of the hypothesis I produced there. So what I could do is I sample many data sets. Uh, for each one, I train a model, and then I am going to evaluate that model on a huge test set in order to approximate the out assembly error. Right, this is, again, this is a valid way of at least approximating these quantities. So, so the following experiment is just an approximation. I just uh, did all these hacks in order to estimate the bias and the variance for decision trees, uh, bagging, and random forest. Uh, so. This is just everything with all the sample data sets. Okay. So this was the, the data set. It's, well, it's not the most exciting distribution, but, but let's just see that bagging and random forest at least improve significantly over decision trees on this type of data. And, and this is just what you get if you, if you run it. So let's just see what, what do we get here. So for decision trees, the out of sample error that you get on this uh, data set is something like 2.5. And we can try to split it into the bias and the variance term. And you'll see here that the, the, the bias is something like 1.115 and the variance is 1.38. And then let's see what happens if you ever put bagging on top of this. So it means that you draw these subsets of this data, uh, you, you get this training data, and now you now repeatedly sample these subsets and train a, uh, I guess, regression tree on, on each of these subsets. And you average all the predictions. And you'll see here that the out assembly error actually gets significantly better uh, with bagging. It drops to something like 1.47 compared to 2.50. And we can also see that, okay, so is this due to a decrease in bias or in variance? And as you can see here, the bias actually increases a little bit compared to just a single uh, tree. It goes up to 1.2 instead of 1.11. So the bias is a little bit worse. But as you can see here, this bagging really did reduce the variance, right? This variance reduces significantly from 1.38 to 0.26. That's a huge decrease in, in variance. On this data set, uh, random forest does actually a little bit worse than bagging. Uh, it has a tiny bit worse uh, bias and the variance is a tiny bit worse as well. Uh, so this is just what it is on, on this data set here. This data set here is also, well, I guess it's very uh, simple data distribution. So, you know, on, on some types of real world data, maybe random forest would actually outperform banging. But the basic takeaway message from these experiments is just that, yes, a bagging and random forest significantly reduces the variance. And this actually turns into an improved out of sample error in, um, in these cases here. And in many real life applications, Bagging in random forest will improve the, the predictions that you make, in particular for when you're using decision trees. Okay. 